A very, very warm welcome and a big hello to everybody, wherever you are in the world. And this is truly a uh, international recording launch. You are very welcome to the launch of Opera Rara's new recording of Offenbach's La Princesse de Trebizonde. I'm Henry Little. I'm the chief executive of Opera Rara, and we're going to be together for the next 40, 45 minutes. Um, so just uh, talking a little bit about uh, Opera Rara and our relationship with Offenbach. This is not the first title uh, by Offenbach that Opera Rara has recorded. In fact, one of our very, very first recordings way back in the 1970s was Offenbach's Robinson Crusoe, uh, which was extraordinarily successful. And we have deliberately maintained a relationship with this extraordinarily versatile and prolific composer in our 50 year history, taking us right up to the present day in 2023. In fact, before the release of La Princesse de Trebizonde, our last Offenbach release, which was an opera called Fantasio, came out in 2015 and was a huge success for us, winning the uh, International Opera Award for Best Opera Recording in uh, that year. And it very much, I think, marks a track record of excellence and interest and exploration of the work, as I say, of one of the 19th century's most versatile and prolific uh, opera composers. Um, I'm very pleased to say, I believe she's here, but I can't actually see her on the screen, um, that we are in fact joined by Offenbach's great, great, great granddaughter, Tatiana Kant Offenbach. So it's wonderful to have you with us. Um, and thank you very much for this uh, endorsement uh, of uh, this uh, special uh, event. So that's enough from me. We're going to start with a very short video. Thank you. When you look into Offenbach, you realise how rich these pieces are. That's a fantastic experience to be able to do that for the first time. La Princesse de Trebizonde used to be actually a, a very played opera. It was super famous at the time it came out. And to say to these houses, look, here's a new piece by Offenbach, which for no reason of quality has disappeared from the repertoire. I've personally known Paul Daniel for many, many years. He has real experience of working with British orchestras here, but also alongside that, he has that rare combination of being able to work with our predominantly French cast, and that's proved to be a really winning combination. In the role of Prince Raphael, which is actually a, a young man, we have a wonderful mezzo-soprano, Virginie Verez. Her father is played by the Canadian tenor, Josh Lovell. And on the circus community, we have a wonderful group of singer-actors led by Loic Félix. We have the extraordinarily experienced and well-renowned tenor, Christophe Mortagne. And then alongside him, we have Christophe Gay, who is singing Cabriolo. And then in the ladies in the troupe, we have Antoinette Denfeld singing Regina, and Catherine Gillet singing Zanetta, and also Katia Ledoux singing Paola. fun to discover a new Offenbach piece. It's such a genuinely funny opera. With Offenbach you always have like silliness and fun. It's a funny opera. Enjoy it, that's it.
that just gives you a just a little flavor um uh of this uh extraordinary music which um i must say once it gets into your head it's more or less impossible to get rid of it but in a really lovely way it stays with you uh uh in a very beautiful manner so um we're really really pleased that uh, so many artists involved in that recording are also with us uh for this recording launch we have Anne Catherine Gillet, who I believe is currently in Toulouse rehearsing Les Pêcheurs de Pearl. Uh, alongside, she sings the role of Zanetta, uh, by the way, one of the uh, circus troupe in the opera. And uh, with her too is Virginie Verez, who sings the role of Prince Raphael. Uh, Katia Ledoux, uh, who I believe is in Vienna rehearsing Cenerentola right now. And also Loic Felix, who sings the role of Paradra and also the uh, le directeur de la, le, de la Loterie. Uh, and uh, we'll hear a little bit more from Loic later, but he is a very old and valued member of the Opera Rara artistic family. Um, also, our partners on the uh, edition of this recording, uh, Frank Harders from Boozy and Hawks, and a very special man uh, without whom this entire project would have been completely impossible. The man who is actually the architect behind the new critical edition that we used for this world premiere studio recording, and that is Jean-Christophe Keck, who is the editor of the Keck, Offenbach edition Keck. Um, and finally, I want to introduce our conductor, the artistic leader of this project, um, who is an old friend of mine, a great colleague, someone with real mastery of this repertoire, and that is uh, Paul Daniel. Um, and so, Paul, if I could uh, just start with asking you just a few questions, just tell us a little bit about what attracted you to this opera. What, what makes La Princesse de Trebizonde particularly appealing as a piece? Particularly uh, because we don't really know it. We've had a few productions here and there scattered around, but the fact that this piece, which was tremendously popular at the time, as, as has already been said, you know, it, it got revivals three, four, five, six years after its premiere in Paris, and it came to London. It was a toast of London. And I was very intrigued as we all were and i thought we've got to bring this thing back to life you know and it's 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 there it's waiting for us to just to come and make friends with it and so we had great fun doing that it was we wonderful did indeed. yeah we did indeed have a lot of fun one of the things that i remember you and i and uh you talking about with um uh, with our recording producer and uh and and sound engineer was how how to capture that very special live Bouffe Parisienne sound, um, particularly in a in an opera studio context, something that's not yeah. live, something that's 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 done in very small chunks. Tell us a little bit about how we how we approach that challenge. Well, I, I, for me, it's always an enormous challenge when you go into a recording studio. Uh, that you must 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 keep the feeling of that live performance right at the front of your minds and particularly with an opera when there's a, there's a kind of sea of microphones in front of you and no audience it's completely not the atmosphere that, that, that Offenbach had when he presented it in the Bouffe Parisienne. Now all of that's very important we have to remember the audience was there you have to try and remember put yourself in the in the in the seats of those the, the, the those those members of the public on that first night the excitement of being in the theatre and then also to, re to kind of replicate as much as possible the, 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 the sound of that theatre. Now, it's the Bouffe Parisienne. It's, a, it's quite a small theatre. It was about 1,100 seats, um, and it was packed full of people, so it would have been hot and an excitable audience and, and a, quite a dry acoustic. Now, that's difficult to replicate in, in, a, in, a, in a, a recording studio. Uh, we recorded in the Henry Wood Hall and we had to really, with the help of Mike Hatch and with Jeremy Hayes, you know, producer, engineer, that we had to really pull the sound in as much as possible to get that feeling of, of every note in the orchestra, every little tiny turn. And the orchestration is fantastically detailed. You know, I didn't want any of that to get lost. I wanted it to have the punch and the kind of crackle 
of, of what it felt like to be in the theatre and to have all those voices as if they're right at the front of that stage, a few feet away from, from their audience, you know, and the, and the sense of that immediacy and all the jokes in the, in the instrumentation and all the little toy instruments that they're asked to play very carefully annotated into the score and the laughter and the joy and the humour and the jokes and the sense of the staging. I wanted to try to get all of that into the microphones and I hope we've got we've gone a little bit of a way towards that because for me live and live performance is everything. Yes, I think you're you're absolutely right and um and I hope that others will agree that we have gone some way to capturing that live sound that spirit of of you know rapid fire comedy and pace and energy that suffuses the whole of La Princesse de Trebizon. So we're going to play you um, a few uh, excerpts to give you an illustration of that particular sound. And the first one is from uh, Act Three, and this is O Malvoisie. <laughs> So there we had uh, Zanetta, sung by Anne-Catherine Gillet, and Prince Raphael, sung by Virginie Verez, singing their wonderful and very beautiful uh, Act Three duet. Um, and Catherine, you reminded us all uh, something which I had actually forgotten when we actually made this recording uh, a year ago, that you, uh, I think uniquely uh, in the cast, um, have actually sung the role of Zanetta before, I believe, some 20 years ago. Tell us a little bit about how it was to come back to the role, and in particular, in a studio recording. Yes, um, it's true. And a secret that I will say to you is that the, the day my agent proposed me to sing it again, 20 years ago, I said, no, I don't <laughs> think I will able to. Maybe... I, I I could do the the the, the second the 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 the, the role of of Antoinette, and they said to me no, <laughs> they want a real mezzo soprano. So, <laughs> so um, what will you think? And I, I I sang it again, and I say oh maybe maybe I'm able to to sing it. <laughs> To sing it again and it was very funny and it was even more funny maybe than the the first time because because I already knew it and have it in my body and moreover in when we, we had a wonderful um rehearsal time we had five days in this wonderful place the wonderful house to create a real spirit team um, and I think that was important to to record it after in studio to keep because we already we knew it. We, for example, I didn't know Virginie, I didn't know uh, Katia, and it was a real pleasure to begin to 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 play and to laugh and to sing it and to live this 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 music before recording it. 
I think I think you're absolutely right, and I think one of the one of the interesting things about La Princesse de Trebizonde is it, it is genuinely a real ensemble opera. Some of the titles we do uh, have really standout roles, whether that's for a soprano or a tenor, typically. But Trebizonde actually. Uh, all the roles, in a sense, are kind of more or less equal, and they all matter. And actually capturing the spirit of ensemble uh, in a piece like this is, is so important. Um, Virginie, let me now turn to you. Um, you've recorded a lot of uh, Offenbach repertoire, and you, and you know this uh area uh, of uh, French music extremely well. What was it like to record something like Trebizonde, which is so unknown for you? Um, you know, it's always a bit uh, stressful to know that you're recording an opera that is not very well known and there is no recording of it. Because for uh, most of the famous operas, there is tradition. Uh, yep. So we know that here, you can do this, or you can do that. I mean, some people don't like tradition and don't want to know anything about it, but I actually like to listen to many, many recordings so I know what people did before, and then I choose what I want to do. Uh, but for that opera, it was not an option. So, you know, we know Offenbach's style, it has to be witty, it has to be charming, elegant. But apart from that, it was all you know, making something new and interesting and yeah, a bit of a bit of pressure, I would say. Yeah, to be the first. <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right. And actually, it's a very common characteristic of everything that Operara does, yeah. because by definition, it is unknown. Um, as artists, there are very few reference points. You can't, as you say, go back and listen to a series of previous recordings. All you can do is try and maybe find where there is some comparison with more popular titles. But um, uh, you're, you're right. So it's a, it's a journey of innovation for for everybody, mm -hmm. I think, and you're you're absolutely right to point that out. Now, I said earlier about the ensembles in this piece, and actually, for me, the discovery of this piece was actually about the discovery of how exciting, fast, appealing, um, ear catching, which was another word that I used previously, those ensembles are. We're going to uh, listen to one, perhaps, of the most raucous, one of the liveliest ensembles that I can think of. Um, and again, this is from uh, Act Three of La Princesse de Trebizonde, and uh, it features the, the circus family. This is a family who kind of accidentally win the lottery and find themselves owning this extraordinary chateau. Um, and uh, this is uh, a point uh, towards uh, the end of the opera when perhaps they've had maybe just a little bit to drink and uh, they decide they're really going to let their hair down and have some fun. So let's listen to this ensemble. Thank you. 
Marvellous. Um, well, uh, and again, you can see those uh, toy instruments, which uh, several of the singers uh, were playing there. And um, our production manager, Aurélie Beaujean, and I had great fun on uh, Amazon trying to find uh, the most kind of garish, kind of loudest ones that we could we could find in order to sort of inject that kind of spirit of uh, raucousness into that that lovely ensemble. So now um, I want to uh, introduce uh, Katia Ledoux and Loïc Félix, who between Hello. them sing the roles of Paula and uh, Sparadra. Uh, so let me start with you, Katia. Um, you're on the verge of a major opera career. Um, I think this is a very exciting time for you. We were absolutely thrilled to uh, bring you on board for what I think was your first opera recording. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience. How was it for you making your first recording with Operara? In fact, your first recording ever, I think. Um, yeah, it was very, very exciting. I think in when I was in university, I used to hear that recordings are something terrifying. And, you know, it's you're just like in this booth and have you know, to be like, perfection and otherwise it's a very stressful environment and everything and so I arrived to the first rehearsal thinking oh my god what have I gotten myself into I mean exciting recording but what is it going to be and in the end it was such a great piece and such a great team to work with and to to do this with um I mean first of all also uh Maestro Daniel was so precise in exactly what he wanted but with so much joy and and fun around the piece that it was just a pleasure it was we had so much fun <laughs> the recording that I did not expect that and also it was my first time in London <laughs> ever so I, I I just had a fantastic time all around I'm really looking forward to coming back actually in May I'm singing at the Royal Opera House and I'm yeah now looking forward to get to know this city even more Great. Well, we look forward to seeing you then. And let me just move to the uh, other end of the spectrum and uh, bring you in, Loïc, because uh, you are uh, an extremely experienced and successful artist with a particular affinity for this repertoire. As I said at the beginning, this is not the first uh, Offenbach collaboration you have made with Opera Rara. But tell us a little bit about what for you was different about this Princesse de Trebizond project. Uh, different, as you said, it's not my first experience with Opera Rara and with Offenbach with Opera Rara. So it's it's not there's nothing really different. But but uh, the the point is that was my uh, very first time with uh, Maestro uh, Paul Daniel, because all the time all the previous ones was with David Perry. Mm -hmm. uh, very good and a uh, uh, perfect uh, conjecture, but um, and uh, with uh, with Paul Daniel, it's a, a new, uh, it was a kind of new new uh, how do you say in English approach approach yeah mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was really so 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 friendly, but he really knew what he wanted and and it it was a, a, a real good work on each phrase sentence note etc and uh, and it was a. Uh, it was a really nice, really nice experience again with Opera Rara. And as um, Anne Catherine said before, uh, it, the, the this place we, we were rehearsing in the Stone House, that the name, mm -hmm. right? And this lovely place created something, created something between us as a team, uh, because the little garden we were all mm -hmm. together all the time. And it was a, it, and it is such a pleasure to to see all those videos you are showing us, uh, because it remind me really good memories, uh, good moments, and uh, and so it's a, uh, it was a really really uh, good experience recording right. this piece. I, I didn't I didn't know nothing uh, about uh, La Princesse de Trebizond before, and uh, no no, it, so it was it was really nice. 
Well, actually, that's the second time that uh, um, the stone house where we uh, prepared the rehearsals for the recording has come up. And uh, I think at this point, I should just say that it is stone house is a beautiful Palladian villa in Lewisham in South London. Um, it is a quite unique space. Um, and as others have said, it's a very special atmosphere in which to work. And we're tremendously grateful to Yvonne Horsfall Turner, who I think may be with us um, for allowing us to use the space, because, as you say, it um, it's it's a really good atmosphere to make a really strong uh, yeah. artistic collaboration. So. Actually, the discovery, as you've said, Loic, uh, we at Opera Rara knew relatively little about La Princesse de Trebizonde. And I remember um, uh, a, a year or 18 months before we started, um, knowing that there was a role for a whole series of what are called pages, page, les pages. Um, they are part of the retinue of Prince Raphael. Uh, uh, and um, I remember thinking, oh gosh, well, okay, what are we going to do about them? And where are we going to find them from? And thinking, okay, well, that's that's uh, this is not chorus. This is um, a group of uh, six uh um, uh, mix of sopranos and mezzo-sopranos and we need to find very good people and I thought well how are we going to do that and so uh, we began a collaboration which I was very pleased about with the National Opera Studio in London um, to find uh, recent graduates um, at the beginnings of their career and I'm very happy to say that several of those uh, page are with us now and I hadn't appreciated until really we started recording what an extraordinary impact they make uh, on the recording. It really is extremely dynamic and lively. So now let's listen to uh, the opening Ronde des Pages from Act Three. Thank you. Marvelous! It's a, uh, and I'm so fond of that little ensemble. It it has such a a lovely, delightful atmosphere of comic mystery to it in terms of what's going to happen next. And actually, for me, it's quite also redolent of uh, Gilbert and Sullivan in a in rather a strange way. It's uh, it's uh, it's very appealing. So I mentioned earlier about. Um, the addition for this piece. And um, with me, uh, we have uh, Frank Harders uh, from Boozy and Hawks, and also Jean-Christophe Keck, as I say, the editor of the Keck Offenbach edition. So, Frank, I'm going to hand over to you um, to uh, ask Jean-Christophe a few questions, a few short questions in French. And uh, Frank has very kindly also agreed and taken on the arduous task of simultaneous translation of Jean-Christophe's answers. So, Frank, over to you. Thank you, uh, Henry. Uh, before I start uh, the conversation with Jean-Christophe, I'd like to give some a little background information about what we are doing at Busy and Hawks. Uh, I presume you all believe I am in London. I'm not, I'm in Berlin. 
I'm working for the German branch of this uh, British uh, publishing company. And uh, Boosie and Hawks purchased some 25, 26 years ago, a German publisher called Bote and Bock. Bote and Bock was Jack Offenbach's German publisher for a very long time. And many of his operettas, opera buff, and also operas have been published by Bote and Bock. And when we started to think about what we are going to do with this heritage, um, we 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 noticed that there is a, an enormous amount of scores uh, in the archive which nobody uh, used anymore. So all the editions from the 19th centuries, which were buried in the basement, and at the same time there were many 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 arrangements of these pieces which in the end had nothing to do anymore with the original Offenbach. And in that very moment, 97, when there was the merger of Boussy and Hawks and Bote and Bock, I met Jean-Christophe Keck in Paris. Uh, that was a, an, an extraordinary moment, moment which I will always recall, never forget. We met in the cafe Les Grandes Marches <laughs> uh, at the, um, the cafe inside the, um, the opera. Uh, La Bastille, and it was it was amazing because it was amazing for him because he was at that time already known as uh, the most important Offenbach scholar, uh, but he was confronted always with music publishers who were on, only interested in Les Contes d'Offman. So he, he he met me, and uh, he yeah we sort of both of us very young at that time still decided to do uh, a monumental um, Offenbach edition. It was totally crazy because Offenbach, having written more than 650 pieces, you can imagine nobody ever will be able to, to do a complete edition of, of his works during his lifetime. But uh, we were crazy enough to start it. And we, we published some, I think, more than 30 stage works only stage works and many, 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 many other works, many of them first publications, first ever public publications or re-editions since the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So over to Jean-Christophe. We, we, this is our great, great adventure, our great adventure, yours and mine. And we, we discovered so many extraordinary pieces. On a, on a fait des découvertes extraordinaires. Uh, la, la, la princesse en est une, mais pas la seule. Mais la princesse de, de Trébisson, chaque, chaque découverte est, est très spéciale. Il y a une histoire derrière euh, et ils ne se ressemblent pas vraiment, ces histoires, sauf qu'il y a derrière, euh, ou la, la raison pour laquelle on a oublié ses œuvres, c'est un mépris pour Offenbach. Et oui, qu'est-ce qu'il qu qu faut, qu'est-ce qu'on peut raconter sur, qu'est-ce qu'il faut raconter sur le cas la princesse de Trébizonde. Ben, la princesse de Trébizonde, c'est un peu un conte de fées, parce que souvent c'est comme ça d'ailleurs, hein, comme expliquait Franck. Tu peux traduire si tu veux. So the 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 the, the history, the story of uh, la princesse de, de de Trébizonde is a kind of fairy tale. Uh, tu 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 le l'emploie dans le sens de de la de la découverte ou de l'histoire. Oui. Non, la découverte. So the, 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 the rediscovery of this specific piece resembles a fairy tale. <clears throat> en fait, je, je connaissais l'existence d'un trésor dans la famille Offenbach. Uh, depuis 25 ans, j'avais la connaissance de ce trésor, mais il était inatteignable. So Jean-Christophe knew about <coughs> that there uh, knew that there was a treasure hidden uh, within the archives of Jacques Offenbach's family for Et, a very long time and inaccessible to the, to the people who, who did the research. J'ai pu finalement euh, avoir accès à ce trésor parce que je savais qu'il y avait dans ce trésor les suppléments, c'est-à-dire ce, les bonus qu'il y a dans le CD étaient dans cette, dans cette maison. Okay, so now we are uh, in the, uh, already in the, in the history of the opera, the development of the opera, um, uh, which is quite fascinating because it, um, it is unique in the in the output of the of the composer because it has not been written for Paris. So Jean-Christophe knew since a very long time that the the music Offenbach wrote for La Princesse de Trébizonde 
for its first version, which has been premiered in Baden-Baden, was hidden in that or buried in this in this archive. So what you can hear on the and the bonus tracks, which are quite extensive, <clears throat> has been published for this recording uh, for, for, for the first time. And I think it's uh, some of it maybe even heard for the first time. Is there music? Est-ce qu'il y a des numéros? Est-ce qu'il y a de la musique qu'on n'a jamais entendu avant? Bien sûr, tous les bonus sont complètement inédits. Et alors, ce que je veux dire aussi, c'est qu'en cherchant ces bonus, c'est par le plus grand des hasards que j'ai trouvé le manuscrit complet de la princesse de Trébizonde. Les propriétaires ne savaient même pas qu'ils avaient ce manuscrit dans leurs archives. Et moi, c'est en cherchant dans la maison que j'ai pu trouver cette, cette partition complète. So, uh, in terms of uh, sources, uh, which you need for a critical edition, you need as many as you can have, of course. Um, not only that we found, Jean-Christophe found, all the supplementary music from the, the original Uh, version, but also the complete manuscript of the final Paris version. J'ai trouvé en même temps euh, la princesse de Trébizonde, les bergers, et j'espère que les bergers, ce sera un projet futur avec Opéra Lola. J'espère, car je dois quand même dire, je suis très heureux de ce projet, parce que c'est très important pour moi de, que, que Offenbach soit servi avec de tels moyens, et malheureusement, ce n'est pas souvent le cas. Et là, je suis très heureux pour ça et je suis très reconnaissant envers Opéra Rara. So Jean-Christophe, who is, is very, very grateful for, for uh, what, you, what you did, uh, what you <coughs> achieved and all the, the means you, you put into this uh, wonderful recording. And I think this brings me into, the, uh, into our next chapter uh, because I wanted to like to open this round table to the audience and to the, to the people who are listening. Uh, something which uh, intrigues me a lot is, uh, well, two questions who, who, uh, linked to each other. Uh, why one one to 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 the to to the Opera Rara uh, friends, the other one to Jean Christophe. <clears throat> uh, why recording Offenbach in London, and why not recording Offenbach in Paris. And a wow. third, third question also linked to it or an encouragement. Uh, Offenbach is probably the, the most popular composer of the 19th century and the most neglected composer of the 19th century in the same time. So what can we do about it? Okay, well, I mean, uh, two extremely good questions. Um, I mean, it kind of goes back to what I said at the uh, introduction. Ever since its beginning in the 1970s, Operara has had a relationship with uh, Offenbach. Um, and it's it's a tradition and it's a, a relationship that we at Operara are completely committed to continuing. Um, I would say that when we were thinking about the casting for this project, um, I was in particular completely adamant and very clear that we must have French singers, because it seems to me that it's only in having that really idiomatic sense of style that we really capture uh, the spirit um, of the well, piece. So which which I think is is very important. Now, you might then say, okay, so um, why didn't you just do it with a a, a French? Uh, company, which of course we could have done, and it would be very interesting perhaps in future to think about a collaboration with a with a French opera company on a future Offenbach title. But Henry, that was not my question. Uh huh. What no, was no, your... my 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 question is why does the initiative for rediscoveries of this repertoire that don't come from 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 France? I mean, why is ah, it well. Rara doing? Okay. A Princesse de Trébizonde, one of the, as you said before, one of the, his his greatest hits. It's um, the same question for Fantasio. It's the same. It's the it's even even more puzzling uh, that, yeah. that you, you did Fantasio. I I, I agree, um, but obviously that is that is something for uh, others to answer. Um, what I would say is that I think there is a 
growing tradition of uh, French-based uh, 19th century Offenbach and other uh, recordings, for example, under the Bruzain label. Um, I'm thinking of a piece like Le Roi Carotte, for example. So I think there is the beginnings of that. Um, but, um, you know, all I can say from an operara point of view is that, you know, it is music that we are very committed to. And I think the idea of doing it in London, I mean, Paul, you may have a view on this, is that I think we kind of get the best of both worlds. If we can find a really strong French cast, as I believe we have for this project, and if we can align that with a British orchestra where the uh, standards of playing, the standards of 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 music, particularly in the pressurized atmosphere of a studio recording, such as we got from our friends at the London Philharmonic, I think in a way you get the best of both worlds. Paul, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I do. I, it's a very wide playing field and it's getting wider. And I've spent many years in France as music director in Bordeaux and the, the orchestra there and the, and the opera. Uh, nine wonderful years, uh, they recorded a lot of this kind of music. They did it in a very different way. I saw a lot of my colleagues recording a lot of this music as well. So the fact that it's happening with Opera Rara is, is for me, particularly special because actually Opera Rara showed the way. You know, it's starting way back then in the 70s, as you say. Um, the baton has been picked up by many, many wonderful orchestras and companies around the world. The fact that it's happening in London, well... I'd, I'm not a great believer in music only having being able to be played by the in the country that it was m written in. You know, I think Elgar sounds wonderful when it's played in Germany or in Spain or in Malaysia. And I think that Offenbach sounds wonderful in different ways and different musicians all over the world. They pick up different things in the music. And I think it only can be enriched by that, you know. And of course, London Philharmonic you couldn't wish for a greater orchestra and a greater bunch of soloists. I mean, the piccolo playing, for example, just listen on this recording. I defy any piccolo player anywhere in the world to play as well as that <laughs> on any yeah, recording. Yeah, yeah, that, that's... Bar. There's just one example, but yeah. right across the orchestra and the, the chorus, uh, fantastic chorus and these, and to have, and to be enriched by these wonderful French soloists coming in, Francophiles. It's, it's, it was just, it was wonderful to have the focus in London this time. Absolutely. No, I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, we're getting towards the end of our time. Does anybody have any question uh, that they would like to raise? You can uh, raise your hand, uh, unmute yourself. Are there any other questions before we uh, move on? I can see that there are several requests in the chat. Uh, around future titles. Le Roi Carotte has unfortunately already been recorded, but uh, uh, Jean-Christophe, I know, is very keen to uh, ignite our interest in Les Bergères, by, which is another Offenbach piece that we will um, certainly uh, look at. But are there any other questions? Great. I, I, uh, a big thank you to Franck and to Jean-Christophe for uh, giving us that uh, very short history of the rediscovery of La Princesse de Trebizon, which very much follows the same of what I call the journey of live operatic archaeology that, uh, <laughs> that underpins everything that uh, Operara does. And it was also very good, uh, Jean-Christophe, that you mentioned that on this recording, not only uh, is there the uh, Paris version of the piece, but also with a series of appendices, we have also recorded a series of uh, pieces that were premiered in Baden-Baden the year before the Paris premiere, uh, but not performed in Paris. So it is very much a complete uh, discovery that you're seeing in this uh, opera re release of La Princesse de Trebizonde. Um, I want to uh, close just by thanking all of the artists on the call, Loïc uh, and Catherine, uh, Virginie and Katia. It's fantastic to have you with us. I also want to mention the artists who are not with us, Christophe Gay, uh, Antoinette Denfeldt, uh, Josh Lovell and Christophe Mortagne, and also to acknowledge our seven pages. I can see at least two of them on the call uh, from the National Opera Studio, and uh, it was wonderful to have you with us. Paul has, um, I think, rightly um, uh, 
explained how important the contribution from the London Philharmonic, our partner orchestra was, especially the piccolo player. I always thought the piccolo player should get extra money for actually just the kind of relentless playing that they had to do right at the top of the register, but uh, they were fa fantastic. And also um, our own uh, chorus. Um, and I also uh, want to thank all of the sponsors and donors and supporters who got behind this project. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that at the close, but um, for your particular contribution to La Princesse de Trebizonde, thank you very much. Uh, just a, a very quick uh, announcement of uh, Opera Rara events which are coming up. Our new Opera Rara Salon series continues uh, this autumn. Um, uh, the uh, next concert is on the 5th of October at Stone House in Lewisham, where we made the rehearsals for this recording. And it features the mezzo-soprano Kezia Binek and pianist James Southall uh, singing songs by Donizetti and Mercadente. And then we follow that with the Spanish soprano Elena Zamudio um, uh, singing a concert and uh, followed by that, uh, the young, very up and coming and tremendously exciting British bass William Thomas uh, accompanied by James Southerl and Florent Mourier uh, respectively. Um, our next big opera studio recording will be next April in Manchester when we will record the 1857, the original version of Verdi's masterpiece uh, Simon Bocanegra with the Halle Orchestra conducted by Sir Mark Elder and that will be followed by a live concert performance of the piece on the 18th of April 2020. 24 in Manchester's Bridgewater Hall. So if you're able to, it'd be lovely to see you all uh, then. Finally, our Donizetti Songs project is now well underway. In fact, in the last two weeks, we have now recorded two out of an eight planned uh, series of recital recordings. Those first two recordings with the American tenor Larry Brownlee uh, and subsequently with the uh, Italian baritone Nicola uh, Alimo. And the next uh, chapter of that Donizetti Songs uh, series will be next May 2024, featuring our artistic ambassador, Ermanella Yaho, uh, accompanied by our artistic director, Carlo Rizzi. And that will also be featured in a Wigmore Hall concert on the 23rd of May, 2024. You can find all of this information and much, much more at www.opera-rara.com. So finally, to bring things to a close, um, yeah, thank you to our artists for being here. Thank you to Paul. Thank you to Franck. Thank you to Jean-Christophe. Thank you to everybody who uh, made a contribution to this. Here it is, this wonderful recording, which is released worldwide, both in physical format and on digital streaming platforms from tomorrow. So please do what you can to spread the word and let's make the Princesse de Trebizonde the success it deserves to be. And finally, as I've said uh, at the beginning, um, everything we do at Opera Rara relies upon the generosity of our many supporters and donors. We're a charity, we don't receive any public funding, and we absolutely rely on the contributions from our our family, our community of Opera Rara supporters to make our work happen. Um, there are several um, uh, contributors, some very substantial ones here on the call. And to you and your colleagues, we are tremendously grateful because it would simply not be possible to, to do what we do without your help. So thank you very much indeed. Once again, thank you very much to everyone for being with us on this launch of La Princesse de Trebizonde. And as I say, enjoy the recording. And here is to many more successful Offenbach projects in future. But for now, goodbye and thank you very much. <laughs>